Prince, our fast chick uh, from Nottingham, who is going to tell us about maximally mutable, mutable Laurent polynomials. I'll start that again. That was a right hash. Maximally mutable Laurent polynomials. <laughs> Cheers, Alan. And uh, thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about a recent archive paper that's joined with Tom Coates, um, Giuseppe Piton, and Kettle Twyton. But of course, the ideas in this are not just unique to us. You know, it's due to the whole program of work. People like Alessio, Miles, Mark, all sorts of people. You know, so don't be offended that your name isn't in this list at the top. Okay. So, I guess the question is, you know, can we classify? Um, Fano varieties or Fano manifolds using mirror symmetry. Okay, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but a very quick recap. Um, the idea is on one side you have a Fano of dimension n, and associated to this is what we call its um, regularized quantum period. So it looks like this. Okay. And, um, and the last person to tell you what these really are, but these, you can think of them as counting curves on X, okay, up to a certain complex structure. But these are counting the number of degree D curves on X. So I'm going to put that in scare quotes. Okay, and we call this the regularized quantum period. And on the other side, what do we have? We have Laurent polynomials. Okay, and associated to the Laurent polynomial, we have the classical period, which is just defined to be an integral. Like that. Okay, and a little bit of complex analysis. You find that this has a beautiful power series expansion, um, like this, where these coefficients are just the coefficient of the constant term. Of successive powers of f. And this is called the classical period. Okay. And we say that f is mirror to x if the periods agree. And so I guess the philosophy behind all of this is that on the one side, we have things that are quite difficult to calculate. On the other side, we have things that are really easy to calculate. So it would be really nice to reduce the problem of classifying final manifolds to classifying the correct Laurent polynomials. Okay. And implicit in all of this is um, the assumption that different Fano manifolds have got different periods. But you know, I think a ratio calls it the telephone number for the Fano manifold. Okay, so I'm not going to do too many examples actually for once, but let me at least just do the example 
that we always do. So let's do P two. So I'm gonna write down the classical period, uh, so the quantum period. So this comes straight from um, given cell. And what's it gonna be? It's gonna be this. And on the other hand, out of nowhere, I'm just going to put this Laurent polynomial and can go away and you can calculate the classical period. And this is just going to be given by this multinomial. Okay. And of course, these two things are equal. Okay. So this F is a mirror for P2. And observe, um, let's move to the Newton polytope. What we're gonna get is if we move to the Newton polytope, we're gonna get this convex body. Okay, I'm gonna place it in the lattice M. And if we take the spanning fan over this, we get the fan of the toric variety. And that toric variety is P2. And so you might say, okay, big deal, you know, but of course not every manifold is a toric variety. So the expectation in general is um, as follows. So suppose F is mirror to X, then the Newton polytope of F. Okay, this defines a toric variety. Okay, and we expect that this toric variety um, is Hugh Gorenstein. Deformation of X. Okay, so this is our expectation, and we call XF a toric model. So it's worth saying that not every Fano is going to have a toric model. There's certainly some obstructions to this. For example, if H0 is empty, then it's impossible for there to be a toric degeneration. Um, but you know, we hope that this is a rare event. Okay, so that most of the time we have a toric model. Okay. So we want to reverse this construction. So I've just shown you going from a Laurent polynomial. Um, well, what did I show you? I suppose what I showed you was I started with my Fano manifold and I ended up with a toric variety. So I'd like to go backwards. So let me introduce Fano polytopes. So we want to reverse this construction. So i.e. I want to start with a polytope, not just any polytope, we'll come to that in a minute, and recover a, um, I'm just gonna put it in square quotes, let's just say sensible um, Laurent polynomial. Okay. 
And the hope would be that if we could figure out which um, polytopes we should start with, then in fact, we'll end up with mirrors for um, Fano manifolds in this, this way. Okay, so what should we do? So let's fix a lattice. Um, of rank n. Okay, let's let um, p in that lattice be a convex lattice polytope. Such that it satisfies three conditions. So the first one is I want the origin to be in the strict interior of the polytope. Okay. Second, I want the dimension of the polytope to be equal to the rank of the lattice. And third, I want each of the vertices of the polytope to be primitive. So together, all this is really saying is that it makes sense to take the spanning firm. Okay, so it's, there's no real mystery behind this definition. It's, and we call such a P a fallow polytope. Okay. But I'm gonna require one additional assumption. So in addition, we require, um, so the sub lattice and prime, which is generated by the vert, well, which is generated by the points of the polytope. Um, how do I say this? Like this. So we require this sub lattice to be equal to the ambient lattice N. Okay, so the, the polytope mustn't span a sub lattice. It's quite unusual for um, small final polytopes, whatever small means, to span a sub lattice, but it certainly happens. And obviously, as the polytopes get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, this could happen more often. So we need this requirement. It's not a very serious requirement if the um, points of your polytope don't generate the sub lattice, just restrict to the sub lattice. Don't generate the lattice, then just restrict to the sub lattice that they generate. Okay, and so I guess our question would be, does there exist a Laurent polynomial? So let's call it F given by some choice of coefficients for each of the points of V with, um, Newton polytope equal to P such that F is a mirror to some final manifold. Okay. So this is the question we want to try and answer somehow. I'm not claiming that I can actually answer this question, incidentally, but we can make a little bit of progress towards answering this question. So let's review some of the techniques that have worked really well. Okay, so I'm gonna say um, there's been a lot of success. So first one, I want to talk about the vertex ansatz. And so, well, I'm not really sure who to attribute this to. Uh, let's attribute it to um, Victor Pizhulkovsky. <laughs> I wish I hadn't chosen Victor. <laughs> um, Pizhulkovsky, yeah. Okay, so 
what does Victor say? So we need to restrict still further. So we can't be working with fat old polytopes. We need to be working with a subclass of the fat old polytopes. We need to work with smooth fat old polytopes. Okay, so what does it mean to be smooth? So for each facet, F of P, we need that the vertices of F generate the lattice M. Okay, so then, well, XP, the toric variety, Um, is smooth. Okay, and we have a easy way to make it, um, to make a mirror for it. So the Laurent polynomial, just given by assigning one to every single vertex of P. Okay. Um, is a mirror um, for XP. So this is exactly what we did in our example earlier when we had P2, okay? This is a smooth Fano polygon and we just assign coefficient one to each of the vertices. This gives us this or polynomial. And in fact, this is a mirror to P2. Okay. So this is this is a perfectly good ANSAT. And how does it perform? Well, of course, it's got the drawback that you can only work with smooth final polytopes. So in dimension two, um, how do I do that? Good. So in dimension two, um, there are five smooth final polytopes. And so, of course, we recover mirrors for exactly five of the 10 smooth del pezzos. Oops. Okay. What about in dimension three? Well, things are a little bit worse. Um, five out of 10 isn't so bad, but in dimension three, there's only um, 18 smooth Fano polytopes. So we'll only recover mirrors for 18 of the 105 um, smooth Fano threefolds. Okay, so, you know, not as good. Okay, so I guess the next step in the evolution of this ansatz is the binomial ansatz. And I guess this could be attributed to Galkin and probably also to Victor. So what do we do here? Well, again, we have to restrict to a subclass of Fano polytope. So we restrict to um, the case where our Fano P is reflexive. What does that mean? Well, it just means that the dual polytope okay, which is defined to be all those points in the um, dual lattice, which evaluate to uh, greater than or equal to minus one. Okay. It's also fun. <laughs> it's 
Sorry. Ten problems here. Also final, but in M. Okay, great. So this works best with dimension two. So what are we going to do? Well, to each edge of P, we just assign binomial coefficients. Okay, and so EG, So here's, um, here's the reflexive polygon associated to P123. Here's the origin here. So we assign coefficients one, two, one along this edge and along the top edge, one, three, three, one. And so our resulting Laurent polynomial is just gonna be given by y over x of one plus x to the three plus two over x plus one over x y. Okay. And then fp is mirror to um, one of the 10 del pesos. Okay. Um, so how well does it work? Well, the point is that there are only, well, I suppose only, there's more than 10. There are 16 reflexive polygons, okay? And these give rise to eight mirrors. Oh, no, let me, that's of course nonsense. These give rise to mirrors for eight of the 10 del pixels. Okay, so what's missing is the low degree, uh, the, the low degree cases. So the degree one and two cases are missing. Okay, it's still pretty good. So what happens in dimension three? Well, it sort of falls apart quite badly. So there are um, 4,319 reflexive polytopes in three dimensions. Okay. And these give rise to mirrors for um, 92 of the 105 smooth final threefolds. Okay. But unfortunately, and this is where it really goes badly. And um, this also gives over 2,000 mirrors, or maybe more so 2,000 Laurent polynomials. And um, that are not mirrors to a Fano manifold. So it sort of falls down quite badly. Okay, so the next evolution of this ansatz, I guess, is the Minkowski ansatz. And this is due to many people. So Coates and Carty and Galkin and Golishev. Myself, and I guess the paper was published in 2013. Okay. And so this is inspired by work by Klaus Altman, um, but it's only a three-dimensional answer. 
So we're going to restrict to um, reflexive polytopes again in dimension three. So what are we going to do? So I need to tell you a recipe to assign some coefficients to the points of this polytope. So for each facet, F with P, we're going to write down a, um, a Minkowski decomposition of F. So we're going to write F is equal to Q1 plus, dot, 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 plus QR, where these QI are non-trivial. Um, and we need them Binkowski irreducible. Okay, so there's choices of decomposition. There may be different ways you could do this. But if you can find one that satisfies the following, then you're in business. So require that um, each QI is either um, a line segment of unit length Or it's what we call an AN triangle. So equivalent under change of basis and translation to an AN triangle. So what's an AN triangle? It's just given by the convex hull of zero, um, E1 and N, E2. E1 and E2 are a choice of basis. So if this is true, um, then we call this choice admissible. Okay. And how are we going to assign a Laurent polynomial? Well, we do the following. So we assign Laurent polynomials to each of the factors QI. And I'll just draw the picture. Well, when it's a line segment, what we do is pretty obvious. We assign coefficients one and one at the two ends. And if it's an AN triangle, which is this. Well, taking the hint from what we've seen before, we assign binomial coefficients along the long edge. And then the Laurent polynomial we assign to the facet is just given by the product of these Laurent polynomials assigned to each of the factors. Okay. And if there's a choice of decomposition such that for every facet, we have an immiscible decomposition, then we can um, glue together these um, Laurent polynomial supported on each of the facets to give us a Laurent polynomial for the complete polytope. So we have for every facet. So we're going to give ourselves the Laurent polynomial given by all points in P and CVs um, is a coefficient um, in one of the Fs. 
So although I'm not going to write this down, there's you know, no problems about how they glue together on the edges because we just assigned binomial coefficients on the edges. So there's not going to be really any issues here. Okay. So how does this perform? Well, you can look at the 4,000 reflexive polytopes and you'll find that around 3,000 of them support an admissible decomposition on every facet. But in fact, because there's a choice of decomposition in some cases, you know, this, um, this decomposition might not be unique, then this gives us slightly more Laurent polynomials than there are polytopes that they're supported on. So this gives us about 3,700 Laurent polynomials. But unfortunately, um, you know, most of, or fortunately maybe, most of these give us the same quantum period. And so this construction gives rise to 165 distinct periods. Okay, and these correspond, um, so of these 98 correspond to a Fano manifold. In fact, it's not just any Fano manifold. In fact, this is precisely the um, 98, X where minus K is very ample. Okay, so it's pretty good. You know, it does a really good job. The, the, there are two, three minor drawbacks to this. The first one is it's dimension dependent. It's really only in three dimensions, although you could imagine overcoming this. It's only about reflexive polytopes. And um, well, it's not quite, on the nose, you know, it's giving us some additional junk that may still be geometrically meaningful, I'm not sure, but you know, it's not really on the nose. Um, and there's another very small issue, which is there are actually reflexive polytopes that support a mirror to one of the Fano manifolds that you can obtain via this construction. So even in the, um, space of just reflexive three topes, it's not exhaustive. All right, so before I can move on to the next evolution of the habitats, let me just talk a bit about mutation. Okay, so let's consider our Laurent polynomial F. And Okay, let's write it in the following form. So suppose I um, look in this direction. So I write PK X1, XN minus one, XN to the K, where um, most of the PK are just zero but they're supposed to be the wrong polynomials. Okay. And I'm gonna write, um, ah. so I need to say something else. So pick some um, Laurent polynomial F in n minus one variables. And let's suppose we can write um, PK is equal to F to the absolute value of K, RK. So this is gonna be for all K less than zero, okay? Where each of the R K is almost a, also a Laurent polynomial. All I'm trying to say here is um, that F to the K divides P K for each negative K. Okay. Then we can just define a map as follows. Um, let's 
going to take x1, xn, and send it to x1, xn, whoops, xm minus 1, f, xn. And by construction, so in other words, whoops, you know, by this divisibility condition that I've imposed. When I apply this to F, I get another Laurent polynomial. So by construction, we have G This is just going to be given by RK and K is less than zero. And then it's going to be given by F to the K and PK. For k bigger than or equal to zero, this is the round. Okay. And more than that, if you try applying this map to the integral formula right at the beginning for the period sequence, what you have is that the period is preserved. Okay. So in particular, if If F was mirror for X, so is G. Okay. And so I guess you know this is kind of the this oh I should say this is called a mutation. Now, I've not stated it in complete generality. You know, I've picked uh, a basis, as it were. So you're free to, you know, you don't need to have picked the same grading that I chose. Okay, but basically, this is what a mutation is, and the point is that it preserves period sequences. So it moves you um, to um, from one mirror to another mirror to another mirror. Okay, and um, you can show, in fact, that if f and g. Uh, mutation equivalent around polynomials, then the corresponding toric varieties, uh, Q Gorenstein deformation equivalent. The converse would be lovely to prove, but we can't do that yet. So the converse would be that if you have, you know, two toric varieties that are Q Gorenstein deformation equivalent, then the corresponding mirrors are related by a, a sequence of mutations. Okay, so after just introducing mutation, let's introduce this final ansatz. So maximally mutable Laurent polynomials, which I'm going to abbreviate to MMLPs. Okay. So these work for this, this ansatz works for any. Um, Fano polytope in any dimension. So we don't need to restrict to reflexive or smooth or anything like that. So fix P, a Fano polytope. Okay, so I'll just emphasize any dimension. Okay, and what I want to do is, again, I'm just like the definition of mutation I gave was lacking some of the details. I'm going to lack. I'm going to miss out some of the details here, more to just give you a flavor of what the definition is. Look in the archive paper if you want the, um, the terrible details of this definition. So let's let F and be a Laurent polynomial such that it's supported on P. Okay, and let's let um, G of F be the graph um, generated by all mutations of F. Okay. 
Okay. So you might ask, well, when, so every vertex in this graph is of a rump polynomial. Every edge is supposed to be a mutation that moves from one Laurent polynomial to the next Laurent polynomial. And you might ask, under what conditions or am I assuming two Laurent polynomials are equivalent? Well, I'm going to push that to one side and say, just look in the paper. It's not terribly important. Okay. So we say that F is maximally mutable. Um, if for any G which is also supported on P mutations mean is that a question? Mutations means composition of mutations. You do one, then another. Ah, yeah, sorry, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe I should just say that. Okay. Yeah, cheers, Miles. Okay, so, so we say that our Laurent polynomial F is maximally equal if you give me another Laurent polynomial supported on the same polytope such that um, the mutation graph of um, this Laurent polynomial contains the mutation graph of F, then, in fact, the mutation graphs are isomorphic. So again, I don't want to, you know, you, you may ask, what do I mean by contains? Okay, there's small technicalities, but I just mean what you think I mean, if I can embed one graph in the other. And then you, you know, you may again argue, well, what do I mean by equals? Because the vertices are going to be different because they've got different Laurent polynomials at each vertex. Sure, absolutely. You know, you can imagine what you do. You throw away the information about the Laurent polynomial. So what we're trying to say here is that the maximal mutable Laurent polynomial is as mutable as possible. You know, I can't tweak its coefficients in some way and suddenly find new areas of the mutation graph that I could never see before. Okay. And we say that a maximally mutable F is rigid okay. if for any G as above such that the mutation graphs agree then actually the Laurent polynomials have to be identical. Okay. So being rigid means there isn't another Laurent polynomial out there that will give you the same mutation graph. Okay, so you're, you're unique. I'm gonna say, um, see the archive paper. For the details. I think, you know, although the details are important, they are just distracting at this stage. So I don't think they're worth going into. Okay. So what can we do with this? Well, in fact, it's always in dimension two because we know so much more. We can go away and we can actually classify all of the rigid maximum mutable Laurent polynomials. And as you might hope, they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with the 10 smooth del Pezzo surfaces. So the um, mutation, the mutation equivalence classes of the um, rigid MMLPs are in 
one, one correspondence with the Hugh Gorenstein defamation families. So remember before the, um, the binomial ansatz was pretty good. It found eight of them, but it was missing the row dimensional ones, uh, the row degree ones. In fact, you know, you go away and you find all possible um, rigid MMLPs and you'll find that they give you those low degree del pixels too. And it doesn't give you any craft as well. You get exactly the correct set. Okay. So theorem dimension three, what can we say here? Well, again, it seems to fix many of the problems with the Minkowski ansatz. So the mutation equivalence classes of um, the rigid MMLPs. Um, in this case, that are supported on a reflexive polytope. Okay. These are in one-to-one -one correspondence. With the um, defamation families. of the 105, well, no, no, back up, of the 98 um, smooth fan of three folds with minus kx, very ample. Okay, so, but this is very, very similar to the result we got for the Minkowski case. Uh, there are, two big differences. So the first one is it doesn't give us anything additional. So in the Minkowski case, we ended up with 165 periods of which we only wanted 98. In this case, it gives us exactly 98 periods. Okay. And the second thing is, and I can only justify this through experimentation, but this finds all possible mirrors that are on the reflexive polytopes, whereas the Minkowski case didn't. Okay, so if you give me a reflexive polytope that you claim it has a mirror that corresponds to one of the um, 98 smooth fanos, then in fact it is a rigid MMLP. So I can only justify that through experimentation, so I can't quite make that into a theorem. Okay, and the second key thing is in fact each of the 105, so the missing seven cases. has a mirror given by a rigid MML. Okay, so the missing seven cases, just like in the two-dimensional case where there were two cases missing, you know, they also got mirrors, of course they have, and these are given again by rigid MMLPs. So this theorem is definitely weaker than the two-dimensional case, just because we don't know as much. You know, it would be nice to characterize exactly what family of polytopes you need in order to find all the 105 of the final manifolds. I can't do that. I'm not claiming I can do that, okay? But, um, but it is pretty good. And I'll also say theorem, but maybe it's more um, um, observation. So I'm gonna say dimension greater or equal to four. So I want to be a bit careful. Um, this is definitely um, what I know rather than what is true. Okay. So every um, mirror to a Fano manifold 
that I know of. Okay, is a rigid MMLP. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, just a few minutes left. I don't want to carry on for too long. What can you do with this? Well, there's a few interesting things. So of course, this maybe opens the way to beginning to um, conjecturally classify, say, mirrors to the Fano fourfolds with minus kx very ample. You know, you could imagine you take the database of the four-dimensional reflexive polytopes, you put the rigid MMLPs on it, and then there's going to have to be a little sifting step. Um, but this should, in theory, give you all of this. Should give you all of the. Um, this should give you representatives in all of the mutation equivalence classes of mirrors for the final fourfolds that have very ample minus k. I think that's a brave thing to say. You know, probably not true, but you know, I like to think it's true. Okay. The other useful thing, and I've not really mentioned this, is in fact. So I don't want to call it a warning. It's actually a bonus. Um, rigid MMLPs um, up to mutation equivalence um, um, don't actually correspond one to one with Fano manifolds. Okay, why not? Well, because I could take any um, terminal um, Fano polytope, so IE, um, this means that um, the points of P is just equal to the origin union to vertices of P. So in this case, I'll draw a bunch of things I haven't really told you. That original ansatz that we saw, where you just put ones at the vertices, is going to give us essentially the only choice of Laurent polynomial. So placing ones at vertices gives us um, F of P, which is a rigid MMLP. Okay. And certainly, you know, you can choose terminal, um, sorry, Fano varieties that don't hugely smooth. So this is not going to be a one to one correspondence with Fano manifolds. And, you know, at least you can say a lot more about this, but basically, you know, it may or may not be true, but it looks like, in fact, rigid MMLPs oh, to mutation. Um, maybe a one to one correspondence with um, terminal panels up to Hugh Gorenstein. Definition. Okay. But, you know, I mean, Alessio was the person to ask for the details about how likely this is to be true. But it certainly, even if this statement isn't actually true, it's not far from the truth. Okay. <laughs> um, and so what you can now do is you could take, say, Miles and Gavin's graded rings database of the Q final three folds, and you can take classifications of. Um, three-dimensional polytopes, and you can try and systematically produce mirrors for all of the examples in the graded rings database. And so Liana Hopberger has been doing good work in this direction. And when you found these mirrors, if you're lucky, you can back build them and discover exactly what the um, what the variety is, and you'll find that indeed, you know, this is one of the things that's in 
degraded rings database. So this seems to be working. So you could imagine systematically populating the graded rings database with possible mirrors. I don't know how you'd prove non-existence, but you know, anyway, this is something you do. And, um, and the other thing you can do, of course, purely experimental is, well, if you're gonna buy into this, we can just start producing um, conjectural pictures of the landscape in higher dimensions. And again, I don't really have the time, I'm not gonna show you any of the results here, but when you start doing this, you can apply techniques from data science to study this resulting sort of landscape that you get and see if there are any patterns in it that we've never seen before. And again, this is turning up really good results. You know, it's really suggesting that there's a lot of structure in this. There's a lot of patterns that we never expected. Hopefully we'll be able to prove them. So that might help turn some of these conjectures into more rigorous mathematical statements. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks very much. Are there any questions?